Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to our Twitter spaces. Uh, finally, bears got some uh, momentum, but markets remain choppy. Uh, personally, I don't expect this uh, next leg down to be uh, fast and strong. Uh, I expect markets to go down, but uh, but uh, not with a strong momentum. We'll see how it goes. I will talk about it uh, later. So two weeks have passed. Uh, it was uh, interesting. Uh, uh, weeks a lot of happened in the markets euro uh, is again uh, below parity and uh, so yeah a lot to talk about uh, okay B brian i will make you a co-host done okay rafael i added you as a speaker mm. Okay, uh, let's start. I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. So uh, why don't we start from Rafael today? So hi, Rafael. What hey. views you have uh, and what you are doing in the market? Hey, bye. Uh, great. Uh, crazy, crazy two weeks again. Uh, so, yeah, as expected, uh, the dollar uh, held. So I mentioned this uh, two weeks ago saying that uh, a lot of people actually panicked uh, when it was uh, time to buy. So I had a great time uh, with this trade, actually uh, kept buying for several days as it was moving up. Uh, same for the short uh, your USD. Made a great trade on this. So yeah, no surprise there. I mean, the macro has not changed. The dollar is confirming this. Another thing that uh, was noted by Brian was uh, the two-year. So the two-year is... Uh, just keep rising. I guess uh, Brian will talk about that. It's the same. It held the uh, trend uh, perfectly and uh, just keep rising. So again, the macro has not changed. It is confirming the fact that uh, uh, despite the crazy uh, bear market rally we've had, we are still in a bear market. And uh, uh, I would say uh, inflationary uh, uh, bear market. So... <laughs> Not the kind uh, you want to be in, I would guess. Uh, what else? Uh, regarding the top, so uh, two weeks ago, we were making the game about the top, and uh, I think we were near. So basically, we went to what? Uh, SPX. I'm checking the top right now. Sorry, I'm a little slow. So we went to 4.325. Yeah, basically, we... Missed it by, uh, what, 70, uh, 75 points. So we were a little early, but we were near. Uh, now the question is, uh, is it uh, the top before the next leg down? Uh, so in this, I would say, uh, I, I don't know. Frankly, I don't know. Um, a lot of things were pointing in the direction that uh, uh, the, the, the top at least at the moment uh, we took the short, was in, uh, where the correlation uh, between uh, sectors, the correlation with uh, short-term bonds. Uh, again, I think Brian will address all this. Uh, my volatility uh, wa signals were also crazy. I mean, we were like, uh, they were, the volatility was stuck at the bottom. Uh, as I mentioned two weeks ago, I hadn't seen that since uh, last year in uh, summer or or at, uh, maybe until September uh, last year when everything was going up. So it was not sustainable. Now the problem is, uh, will it go? Will it go lower and uh, will it go uh, soon? Um, for now, what I see is um, most of the indexes are holding, uh, holding a trend. So uh, on MFR, I can see that uh, the CAC, uh, the, the S&P, NASDAQ, the Russell, uh, they have, uh, none of them have changed the uh, trend. Uh, only the DAX has changed the uh, trend back to, to bearish. So what I did was uh, I deleveraged uh, bigly on uh, 41.80, and then I waited for uh, my, my trend. And actually, it was also the low of my range for my volatility range indicator, uh, for one twenty-two or twenty-eight, depending on the days. Uh, but I chose twenty-five, and I deleveraged big time uh, there. 
now I'm waiting. So I'm still net short, but uh, I'm waiting. Biggest position is uh, FX, and uh, short equities are now at minimum. Uh, this morning, uh, for fun, I took a small uh, long position actually in uh, SPX pre-market at uh, 4115. Uh, and for now, it's working. So, but it's, it's to see uh, I'm more in the camp of a bounce. So, um, I took this to see if uh, it, would be, it would work. Uh, other stuff that were also uh, interesting on MFR were the fact that the, the, the lower... Uh, uh, range we are not moving uh, down I mean the markets were crashing but we reached the low of the range and they didn't budge uh, that much the VIX also didn't budge uh, VXN is back to I can see now it's back to bearish went to neutral but now back to bearish uh, RVX same so um, I'm more inclined to think that uh, maybe it was too easy and a lot of people actually, uh, probably in the past two days, maybe again today, they are shorting like, oh, will this level break? I need this level to break. And they are shorting and shorting and shorting. So my guess would be that um, maybe the big boys will fuck with them. Uh, they will force some, um, some, um, some of these guys to actually uh, uh, get out of their short and create another squeeze. How high will the squeeze go? I don't know. Um, I guess one point also that uh, Brian will raise because we talked about that uh, before is um, um, we expected uh, this move down and uh, we expected to see the trend not to change at the moment where maybe the break could happen. So basically, you are in one of the video Brian did, he mentioned that uh, we may have a correction, but we may have the indexes not changing trend, which we have. And what would matter at that particular moment would be correlation. So I'm very happy to, if Brian can address this thing. One thing that is bothering me is, again, the fact that uh, even though we would have expected uh, a lot of bullish trend to sustain this, uh, this move and then wait for the confirmation to, to get the crash, I see too many, um, too many bullish trends still and uh, in volatility, too many bearish trends. So for now, I prefer to take the chips uh, out of the table and uh, I'm waiting. I'm waiting, and I'm more inclined to think that uh, we still have a bounce. Uh, maybe the 4200, 4300 area, where I would actually go very big on, again on the short side. But for now, I really don't know. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. Volatility is uh, still uh, very low. And I have uh, quite a few mixed signals. Um, so, 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 yeah, we'll talk about that. Okay, Matt, what are your views and what are you doing in the market? Hey, guys. Um, my views haven't shifted much from two weeks ago. Um, I did uh, degross a lot of my short positions uh, in the last, uh, I would say, five trading sessions because I had gone big again, including some puts on IWM. HYG and calls on SQQQ. I peeled those back um, and uh, am not quite ready to add yet to any of those. Um, there are, are, based on a kind of a, a Python script that I wrote in the last couple of weeks, there, the, if you look longer term, longer duration, things are still looking way overbought. Um, in terms of the indices and, and many individual equities, et cetera. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not room to go higher. And as I think I've mentioned in our chats uh, with Brian and Raphael and, uh, and others and Vi as well, um, uh, the, this, it's going to be a tug of war. <laughs> Excuse me. It's going to be a tug of war because there's still a, a large retail crowd out there that that is being blinded by the uh, the uh, Fed pivot narrative um, that everything is hunky dory and 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 everything looks good so it's just time to jump in and the the bull market is going to resume itself and and I don't believe that uh, at all um, I'm I'm fairly certain that that we are in in just a bull market rally still it it could as Raphael said I think. Uh, 
4,200, 4,300 is a legit target target for this thing to continue and, and even shake out more shorts that thought the thing that thought it was over. Um, but at the same time, uh, and I'm right in line with Raphael that if this thing does go up to 4,200, I'll uh, pile back into shorts. And if it goes to 4,300, I will probably go all in. Um, so I, I don't see this thing getting, I mean, if you look at it and all you have to do is I'm not a big fundamentalist, but, but just looking at, at the economic reports that are coming out and, and also looking at some of these energy inflation uh, stats that are coming out in, in, especially in the Eurozone. I mean, this thing is just a, a, a time bomb waiting to, to blow um, and it's ticking and it's ticking fast. So, I do believe that <clears throat> we are also entering a, a period of seasonal weakness. Um, uh, September and October have traditionally been uh, months that spook the markets, especially if you start to get information coming in, out that, uh, that uh, throws anything off, including that Fed pivot. Um, I don't see any signs that inflation has ended its, its trek. It may have come down because they talked gasoline prices down, but but um, you've still got food inflation. You've still got housing inflation, despite the fact that mortgage rates are up. I mean, in my town uh, where I live, Boulder, Colorado, um, houses are st- – there's a house down the street from me that was certainly a nice house that was fixed up um, and was a spec home. Uh, they listed it for i think some absurd amount two million dollars plus and it it didn't even hit the market for a day before it was under contract so so the fed still got some work to do if they're trying to deflate this bubble in my opinion and uh beyond that um just uh basically sitting big positions are uh fx which i've taken my dollar position down uh to about half of max um after the rally i was at uh close to max on that I started nibbling on gold yesterday and today I added more and I'm at uh, 300 basis points on gold. My uh, only fixed income position is short junk bonds, which I have taken down as it's rallied. Uh, I took it down from max to about half of max. And then I've still got a bunch of core shorts that I'm holding on to. Um, <clears throat> and, and, uh, in both uh, ETF and individual equity spaces, but I have a lot of room to add to those, and 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 I'm just kind of adding little bit, little by little, bit by bit. Um, one of the major changes I made is I was banking on a, uh, and, and I didn't bank big. I had a short leash on it. Was uh, uh, the energy sector in terms of the commodity side, oil and gas uh, coming down. And I uh, removed those shorts uh, two days ago. So I'm no longer uh, in any real commodity positions with the exception of uh, basic materials I've got a short on. Um, that's that's about three quarters of a max position. Um, and my reasoning for that is, is whether we're in stagflationary or disinflationary deflationary times, um, basic materials tends to get hit in both of those uh sec in in both of those quads um so i'm perfectly comfortable with that i'm also short uh bitcoin via biti and i am short riot but uh not a huge position um and i'm just adding on any any rally i think that i think crypto is going to be the first to go and i'm more than happy just to slowly kind of build these positions up um so that's about it from my perspective Okay, Brian, are you ready or do you want me to go first? Well, I can go by. That's okay. Yeah, sure. Cool. Um, yeah, really interesting. Uh, pretty awesome course of a week and a half to kind of catch that two-day move. It was really uh, really played out ex- exactly how you'd expect it coming off of a top like that. And so I think the best way to explain what happened would be, um, you know, compare that down move to the big squeeze we had on CPI. So like heading into CPI, I would say we were in a similar position as we were heading into that big down move. The key difference was, and uh, by, um, Raphael was mentioning this during his speech, was that um, correlations were very weak heading into CPI. So CPI, if you remember, August 10th, 
a few days before August 10th, we were just kind of chopping sideways. We were sitting at what I thought at that time to be the 4,200 call wall, which just like we saw 4,300, 4,200 was a potential top. And we started drawing down off that call wall. But the problem was um, correlations, both sector correlations as well as stock bond correlations weakened into that down move, which is a signal then that there was un- that we were unlikely to continue any lower. And so obviously, you know, Looking back, we covered into that, and then we squeezed back up, and then had a few more days of squeeze. Correlations started strengthening on the way up, both stock bond correlations as well as um, sector correlations on the way up into 4,300, which was another shot at being a strong call wall, and it ended up being a, a pretty strong top. We, we went up just above it, you know, went up to that 200 DMA. All the normies sold there, and, and that actually ended up being the top. So um, as much as people hate on the 200 DMA, I guess uh, it was actually a top here. But um, sold off of that, went back down to 4,300. And then the question was, like, what was going to be the catalyst to break us off and unpin 4,300? Because we were just stuck in like really strong positive gamma at that point. Um, and what was going to be the catalyst to break us down? And what we noticed was, like, credit spreads – just had absolutely, you know, collapsed in terms. So they they had tightened. Excuse me. Yeah, they had tightened. So like looking at the LQDH as a proxy, that had risen to a, a monthly high um, into that move. And so, you know, really the catalyst for us now to where we are here was the the coming back of Fed hawkishness. You know, what was going to be the cue for the markets to finally start listening to the Fed again, that they weren't going to be pivoting and they weren't going to be um, backing off. And so that's why we were plugging so closely into the two-year yield. And throughout the entire move upwards, all the way from even August 10th, when it was a you know, relatively you know, good CPI report, it's still stuck at that level, slowly inching up the entire time, all the way up to today now where we're pushing the cycle high again on the two year yield and like plugging into that correlation, how that was correlating the to S and P both two year yields, as well as the dollar, which started rising even before that breakdown happened was a key, a key thing for us to be confident at 4,300 to kind of just start loading up on the shorts there. And that's what we did. And then on the breakdown, um, I kept sending things out on Twitter. Like I'm not covering here not covering yet. A lot of people out like covering for small amounts, but the fact is, like on that way down, and we were going into gamma flip, which at the time was uh, right above 4,200. I think it was like we had like spy 425, and then 4,200 and S&P were like the key flip levels at that point. Correlation strengthened on that move. That's the opposite of what we saw into the CPI report. Correlations across sectors strengthened versus spy into that down move. Stock bond correlation was strengthened into that down move, and plus you had opex as a catalyst with a bunch of people chasing calls above. Those were all deteriorating into OPEX. And so you had dealers enhancing volatility. You had the big down day on Monday. And so that was great. Now, where we are now, um, I, I'm not at a point yet where I've covered that much. I, I did a little bit of covering on that big down day just to kind of deleverage because I was at max size. But, um, but broadly, I'm still really gross short. And I'm just not convinced at all that that we're going to get some kind of immediate bounce back upwards uh key levels for me is spot that's right where we bounced off of today spy 415 um that's like the absolute gamma strike so as long as we're staying below that we're in put control territory pretty heavily put control territory and you'd expect like more volatility and instability below and on top of that like these sector correlations are remaining heightened so now now that we're off of the call wall, you know, there is some squeeze risk looking at those correlations. So if we get above SPY 415 and the sector correlations remain heightened on that move, which there was potential of it happening today, but it didn't, um, that could catalyze a squeeze back to 4,200 at least. And then if we get above 4,200, a lot of those calls above have gotten absolutely wrecked through this down move. They've all closed out. And so, yeah, you could get a squeeze back to 4,300 um, on that move. I, I think it's unlikely um, because of our proximity to Friday Jackson Hole. It's really unlikely that Vol gets sold much, much more than here. Sure, it's possible, but like 
everyone that's added puts at this point has done it in preparation for Jackson Hole to be protected into that. And so you got some ball selling today, but I would expect VIX to bounce or at least trade sideways tomorrow. And you won't get um, a release of that event vol until after Jackson Hole uh, passes. And so the big question is, like into Jackson Hole, does the Fed disappoint enough to then spike VIX further and dump equities? And, you know, some people think that they don't need to. You know, implied vol has moved up a good amount and, and it, you know, it's expecting a, a good disappointment from Powell. But you just look at where equities are and you look at where credit spreads still are. I mean, LQDH has even bounced over the past couple of days. So even after mm-hmm. dumping on into Monday's move, credit spreads have re-tightened uh, over the past couple of days on just chop sideways. And so we're not in a position where people are scared of the Fed, of the Fed staying tight. And we're not in a position where, um, especially with stocks at 4140, where we close today, where 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 we're like where financial conditions are as tight as they were at the lows back in June and uh, before that in May. And so I think from a macro perspective, especially with what the two-year yield is telling you going back to cycle highs here, dollars staying strong um, even after some pretty recessionary um, data prints the last couple of days. Um, I think the macro is telling you that the Fed is going to be hawkish. And so how hawkish can they be? That's the big question. And um, what I'm going to look for to whether I stay short into that event is one, do we get above SPY 415? If we get above SPY 415 on strengthening correlations, I'll be reducing short risk in that time. But if we just stick down here or even if we sell into 4100 into Jackson Hole, you know, Powell's speech is not a midday speech like we've seen. It's at 9 o'clock in the morning or excuse me, 9 o'clock central time, so 10 o'clock eastern. Um, so that's, you know, right on the open pretty much. And so – You know, I I would be short into that event if stock bond correlation as well as sector correlations are telling me to. Now, I'm not necessarily, you know, would want to be short uh, bonds into it. I think if anything's going to rally the most on it, it it would be bonds, uh, long bonds, that is. But like equities are the things that haven't gotten the memo here. You know, like the 10 year yield. I mean, yes, it's been it's been rising recently and it was a great, um, you know, correlation to how show that risk was building to the downside but it's been rising since the beginning of august like this isn't something new that bonds have been under pressure they've been under pressure now for an entire month and so they've been leading potential hawkishness from the fed especially the two-year yield and then as well as you know an influx of potential inflationary stuff which is going to keep them involved and equities just haven't gotten the memo equities have been squeezing since august 1st so best risk reward here on the short side is definitely via short equities. And so like, that's my focus and like where I'm spreading them out. I'm spreading them out to rate sensitivity, low beta and growth is really the bulk. And in some, um, some small cap, you know, broad factors and retail and whatnot um, is my focus on the short side right now. I don't see any difference with what's occurred right now, as opposed to Jan, as opposed to um, the big drawdown in April, as well as the big bra- drawdown in June. You know, we're, we're way overextended in terms of looking between the near-term range and the long-term range in MFR. Um, Hearst exponents are absolutely insane right now, By uh, I've never seen them this strong. Maybe you've seen them stronger. But, like, I've got point eights on the nearly point eights on a lot of the U.S. sector ETFs. And so what that tells me is that it, when it does go, it's going to go. And that's what caused the two big gap down days you saw earlier in the week on Friday and Monday. Um so, you know, that's why I stayed short through that, because that was a red day followed by more red days. And today we got a green day. And so does that mean that now we're just going to bounce back up and those hearsts are going to accelerate higher? Well, it's possible. But in order for to see that, we have to get above 415 and you have to have those correlations staying strong. And so tomorrow I could totally see us opening red and getting back on track. Um, we have the BOJ overnight. They could say something dumb. Um, but in general, like vol shouldn't pass until Jackson Hole and then into Jackson Hole. I think Powell has to be more hawkish than even people think they might, which should catalyze, I think, another down move like we've seen. So uh, I'm staying short. I'm unconvinced yet to be covering shorts aggressively and I want to catch the rest of the move. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, those exponents are insane. Totally. Uh, 
Um, usually you see those uh, high Hearst exponents on some small cap or individual names, but yeah, to see uh, such high values on sector ETFs and very, you know, big assets, yeah, yeah, it's not, uh, it's quite rare, so interesting situation. Um, Okay, um, so as I said, I have quite mixed uh, signals. Uh, so, uh, of course, we had some bearish uh, momentum, and uh, I expect that to continue, but uh, Chop is still here, so I'm not very convinced that this leg down will be uh, strong, fast, and aggressive. Uh, uh, it can be a uh, move down with a lot of choppy days. Uh, we will see. So uh, biggest mixed signals are in correlations. Uh, what uh, makes me uh, quite happy and wanting to short the market is that, uh, for example, five five day correlations are um, going higher, even though uh, other time frames are still not. So, but uh, short term time frames can be leading. So. Um, that can be a, a signal. Uh, anyway, so uh, first of all, uh, average cross-sector correlations are not extreme. So, for example, 30 days, it's like 0 0.51, 10 days, 0 0.6, and 5 days, 0 0.64. Uh, but there is a different story if you look into average sector correlations to SPY. So, so not how sectors are correlated together, but how all those sectors correlated to SPY. So, and uh, on 10 and 5 days, it's this, those correlations are high and going up. So, so it's uh, quite important. So, uh, because average cross-sector correlations are not only not extreme, but also not going up a lot. Uh, so, yeah, but sec correlations is to, to SPY are going up. So, for on 30 days, it's 0 0.72 and on 10 days 0 0.81 and 5 days 0 0.83 so quite high but uh, uh, volatility uh, is still low so uh, now basically the only trades I have is are, are the ones I have in my options account and uh, uh, those trades are still iron condor so first first I had spy uh September monthly expiration, I had four, 440, 445, uh, and 360, 355 iron condor. So it's a very wide wing iron condor. Uh, I closed it uh, because I have a rule uh, to close uh, at 50%. So when I make 50% of all the p potential profit, I close that trade. Uh, but yesterday I opened another iron condor. So so now I have Iron Condor again, and this one is October expiration, and it's uh, 450, 455, 370, 365. Uh, yeah, so that's what I have from from options perspective, and and the main reason was um, basically big premiums, and of course that's what I saw and what we saw in market direction uh, today, um, because. Uh, Implied vol premiums are are there, and uh, I saw that those iron condors are, are trading for a decent credit. Uh, so I sold another one, but of course, uh, the iron condors can be easily managed by rolling uh, the un untouched side and so on. So we'll see how it goes. But the overall rule is to close those uh, at fifty percent. That's what I do. Uh, from uh, not options portfolio. Well, uh, basically, no changes. I hold uh, uh, cash dollars, and the only change is that uh, yesterday I unhedged XLU IWM. So XLU IWM now, now looks um, quite good uh, uh, already. So so we'll see how it goes. Yeah, but I I removed all the hedges and I have uh, this uh, open spread again. Uh, from a momentum uh, perspective, what we see, uh, basically, um, no, no surprise, XLU, XLE, and dollar strong uh, indices weak, uh, especially on 5 and 10 days, and bonds look terrible. Silver also looks ter terrible. So on 30-day basis, TLT and SLV are deeply negative. And uh, if we look at 10, also TLT and SLV are... are uh, best uh, candidates for for negative uh, moves. Of course, uh, we already had those moves, so I agree with Brian that bonds maybe 
if you are not short them already, maybe today uh, is not the day to start the position. But if you are holding those uh, shorts and bonds, maybe maybe you can keep and see what the, what uh, price action will look like tomorrow or on Friday. Uh, also, REITs and financials on five day basis uh, are the weakest from uh, sectors, so so it's also interesting. But yeah, from uh, spy sectors and the, the main stuff, uh, basically dollar is the king uh, again, and XLE. Um, also, I want to mention that XLE is very interesting because now it's almost non correlated uh, to spy. I mean, we are talking like. 0 0.12, 0 0.2 correlation to SPY. So XLE is um, also interesting. Uh, on uh, develop, In developed markets, uh, basically momentum is negative across the board, except maybe Israel and Norway. Uh, QAT also in some time frames, yeah. So basically Israel and oil and energy related countries um, are still not very negative, but overall uh, indices in all uh, developed uh, countries are negative. So, so yeah, one thing uh, to note. And from emerging markets, also not surprised that Gulf countries, so Arab Gulf countries are um, performing uh, best, and also EWZ. So EWZ is also performing well. Um, I have that in my watch list. Uh, for a spread, uh, so yeah, of course it's it's not the trade, but uh, uh, EWZ versus things like EWM, as an example, uh, that's what I have in my watch list, and I'm looking for signals, so maybe it will be another pair trade for the future. Uh, and uh, yeah, commodities. Uh, mm, a lot of commodities look uh, terrible, except maybe coffee, corn, uh, uranium, and natural gas. Well, of course, natural gas now is very uh, important topic. Uh, you all, I, I'm sure you all see what's happening in the markets and from uh, global uh, geopolitical stuff and so on. So it's no surprise. Yeah, but basically. Uh, uh, I would not touch uh, other commodities and uh, maybe uh, energy when you get a strong signal and strong uh, momentum in your favor. Uh, I want to touch also on uh, correlations uh, uh, a little. So, of course, uh, good news for bears is that SPY TLT is uh, positive on all time frames, so 30, 10, and 5 days. Uh, also, I want to mention that on, on all time frames, SPY gold is also po positive, so... Uh, I think that uh, touching gold is not <laughs> the best idea. So, so yeah, for those gold gold bucks or people who want to buy gold, well, of course, it's your uh, uh, narrative, it's your uh, opinions and uh, strategy. So, so do it if, if you feel. But yeah, it's not surprised. But I was talking uh, almost uh, on every spaces that I don't like gold, not only because of this environment, I just don't like it, but now signal supports my view. So gold, uh, no, at least not for me. Um, yeah, from sectors, so basically the only sectors that have really low uh, correlation to SPY is XLE and X XLU. XLE lower, XLU is also not very high. So, yeah, that's what, uh, and from a signal perspective, XLU IWM uh, starts to look good. We'll see how it goes. Uh, so that's why I unhedged those, uh, this uh, spread. Yeah, so that's uh, for me for, for, from the signal perspective. And yeah, my, my book is still, uh, my main account is basically dollars and XLU IWM and my, uh, options account is very, very wide wing uh, iron condor on SPY. Yeah, so that's it from, from me. Yeah, one, one thing on gold buy, I, I didn't fully understand gold at all in like the first half of the year, but I started kind of looking into more and you know, reading some things up. And, you know, gold should not work in this environment. Like there was this, like right before this, um, this uh, big drawdown started, there, there was a chance to buy gold. It was like right around 1775. And um, I basically looked at that and I was like, if gold bounces here, like I'm about to get wrecked on the short side because you got gold that's like really inversely correlated to the dollar at this point. Yes. Also, and, then, and then like gold is trading with real, with real, um, real yields. And so like what happened was when the Fed went, you know, incrementally dovish after the last meeting, like real yields uh, dumped. And so, like, that's why you had a big bounce in gold through that move and then obviously it, it going opposite the dollar. 
And so like here going into like Fed hawkishness and expectations on Friday, I mean, gold should not work. If gold works, then again, like I'll probably get wrecked on the short side. So um, that's yeah, correct. Uh, and also, but uh, of course, I hope most people know that already, but gold is not an inflation hedge and we are in an inflationary environment. Gold performs better in deflation. So if, uh, if someone says that gold is good, good inflation hedge, well, uh, don't listen to them. <laughs> yeah. Well, Bai, I'll, I'll just interject there because if we're looking at, at, at most what most people look at for quadrants, and as I mentioned earlier, um, you have several asset classes that work well in both stagflation and deflation. And we are not in an inflation period right now. We are definitely in a stagflation period where we have economic stats going down while asset prices move up. And so gold and commodities and in, in, in general are good for both those both of those quadrants. Just my two cents. And that's and I didn't add big to gold. Like I said, I'm at 300 basis points and it's probably going to get reduced if gold goes up. For me, I'm a technical analyst, and it looks pretty good on on a chart, as Brian would say, with the lines. Um, so I I think it it looks good from a, a risk reward perspective here. And as I say, I, I wouldn't go any bigger than like half of my max position if I even went there. I'm I think I mainly put it on as a hedge because I see risk. Um, of an upside in, in stocks, and I think gold will follow. Um, but again, it would probably be short-lived, especially if, if, if statistics keep coming in with um, inflation um, rising. So that's, that's where I came from with my uh, add to gold today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely agree regarding stagflation. By saying inflation, I was talking about the mar this market, not the uh, overall economy. But and the, yeah, regarding all, uh, of course, it all depends on your risk management. If you have good strategy and it's looking good, of course, you just buy it. You just follow your pro process, of course. Yeah, and, and I, th I think you're right in that. Like, like on that point, like if gold does bounce and it's gonna, you know, retest kind of where it came from, um, yeah you'll probably get an equity squeeze too. I think those are hand in hand. So if like you want to have some kind of hedge on the other side of opposite of an equity short book, I, I guess gold would be good. I, I, I was doing that, you know, in the first part of the year and part of this drawdown, I did it with bonds. I did it with gold and um, yeah, I guess it was good. I, I think I would have rather just to like focus on the short book and then just reduce it up and down. If I thought there was a squeeze rather than kind of putting those hedges. Cause like right now, I don't see a scenario where where gold and stocks work. I just I don't see it at all. And like, what's really interesting is that if you plug in, obviously, like all the stock signals, like they're all bullish, right? And so, like, that's one thing Rafael was mentioning. And like, the perspective I have right now with the way I'm trading is like it is not trend focused. The way I'm trading, I'm trading based on correlation. I'm trading based on the Hearst exponents, gamma positioning. And then as well as, you know, understand that there is a big skew between near term and long term downside. And so like the the path of least resistance from a mean reversion perspective, I guess, is down. And so like that's what I'm trading, like all stocks like I mean, you should see like my short book, which is like the signal strength of the stuff in my short book. It's all like pretty strong signals. And so like I'm ignoring the trend at that point on stocks. But then if you plug into gold and you know, going on that theme that. You know, if gold works, stocks work. I mean, gold is bearish trend in MFR. It's got neutral uh, momentum. Hearst is 0.72. And it's got a lot of excess long-term downside. And so, like, I would actually look at gold right now and be like, oh, gold is weak. So stocks shouldn't work either. So just my two cents on that. Yeah, by, by the way, uh, gold, uh, GLD went uh, neutral. I think it was the day the stock, uh, for the bear market rally picked. And so it lasted one day and then went back to, to bearish and the stocks uh, crashed. Yeah. Yeah. And like, it, what's cool is like, I might want to look at that more closely next time, the next BMR. And like when we're turning, and it's a good signal right now too, because it's like a lower volatility play on, um, I guess, on equity upside. And that means that it's going to be, maybe more reactive from a trend perspective, like it won't go so far extended to bullish trend to where you have to fall a lot further for it to go back to 
uh, neutral or bearish trend. Like you said, it turned from a trend perspective right when equities turned, but still being bullish trend up there. So I think it, it was actually a good signal. Yeah, I noticed that regarding gold switching to neutral. Um, yeah, it was interesting day. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, maybe we can start uh, taking questions. Uh, so if anyone has any questions or comments or you want to just uh, to say something uh, related to our conversation, feel free to uh, request to talk and uh, we will accept you and you will be able to ask your questions or comments. While we are waiting for uh, questions, uh, anyone wants to add anything to, to the conversation? Um, yeah, I, I guess maybe uh, let me ask Rafael a question. Do you do you see much different? Like right now, you think you're comparing the current vol setup and the current market setup. So you said like uh, April 10th and then January something. So like, what are you looking right now? for to confirm whether this is a head fake or like we are you know going for the next leg down okay give me a second i will take out the vix yeah so basically uh, the the that's that's also why i, I entered the long vix uh, one day early uh, because um, I saw uh, VIX uh, price action uh, behaving the same way as uh, end of December and uh, end of uh, March. So basically the way it behaved was the same. And uh, that's why I bought the VIX and I thought the floor was in. I was one day uh, early, but uh, then you could see the, the price action was the same. And uh, in both instances, what you get is first you get a, a spike in VIX, then you get a, a sell-off in VIX, and uh, then you get the real move. So that's basically what, I, what I'm uh, thinking will happen. I think now we are in the, so we had the bottoming of VIX uh, around, uh, let's say, 1950 to 2070, 20, that, were, that were the phase where you could accumulate actually the, the long VIX uh, positions. And uh, now we are in the second phase where you got the, the spike. And this one actually, I think, will, uh, will suck people in uh, to short, maybe a little too early. And now I'm waiting for uh, VIX to retest the 21, uh, I would say 21, 2150 area. And that would be the time where I think uh, the, the, we, will, we will have the opportunity to go, to go big on the short side. I don't know how the, the equities will react while VIX is doing this. Because you can see, for example, in, uh, in both instances, in both end of de December, beginning of January, and uh, end of March, uh, beginning of April, equities didn't uh, behave the, the same way. So you had, uh, uh, how to say, you had some kind of a top, then go down. Then in one instance, uh, Speaks was just riding down, but the move was just riding down slowly before you got the drop. And in the other instances in January, you got small, you, know, you got a drop, then a bounce, and then you get the real move. So I would guess... Uh, the best is don't focus on indexes, focus on the VIX. And basically, when you see the VIX uh, touching 21 or 21.50, that's when you put the, the shorts on. So if you had to consider only VIX, of course, you have to look at other things. But that's what I'm expecting will happen. I don't think, for example, uh, this week or the next, we just stay above uh, 22, uh, 22.50 and we just uh, explode and go directly to 40. I think first we get, uh, we get a move down to 21.50, maybe 21 for maybe three, four days, and then we got the real move. 
Uh, I don't know if it answers your question, but that's basically uh, yeah. what I see in VIX. Yeah, I guess so. I guess that, like the other flip, the flip side of that, you know, what would you need to see for for you to to feel like that the move to twenty one isn't coming? Like, would you kind are you kind of waiting for maybe MFR to flip bullish on VIX or or what? Uh, so of course I would feel much better if I saw some confirmation on uh, on uh, the index's uh, trends, uh, but uh, I'm pretty confident this is what's going to happen. I mean, uh, the the way the VIX is behaving, uh, if I was behaving from uh, tens to to eighteens, was very predictable because it's uh, it's the same way it behaved the last time uh, VIX made a base. So uh, I'm how to say I'm thinking in terms of uh, if this is what happened before, uh, there is a very high chance this is what will happen again. Why would I think uh, okay it happened before, but maybe this time it will be different? So my base case is a drop of VIX and then uh, we go up. The only question for sure is uh, where will uh, the speaks go be when this happens? Uh, will we be lower or not? Uh, will correlation have changed, etc.? If there is more arguments to to play this move, of course I would feel more comfortable. But uh, I don't think I will care. I think if the VIX does what I think it will do, it will confirm that I'm right. And uh, and on 21 uh, VIX, I will go uh, big on the short side because it will confirm the big drop we are expecting is coming. Yeah, yeah that makes can, I, sense. can I interject real quick? And I'm just going to use my simple old wall technical analysis. And Brian knows that I love these things um, on on the, the daily candle chart for VIX. Um, there's a gap and gaps. If you look back are almost always filled, whether it's within one day, a couple of days. And that gap happens to coincide with Raphael's levels and is sits at about 2125 right now on VIX. And and sure it could go through that as well, but my personal feeling just looking at that says that we're going to fill that gap and then we can continue and that gap may relate to to uh S&P 4200 or ES 4200 and and again that's where the shorting begins for me or not it doesn't begin but it continues. Mm. Okay, so, so I'm sorry, but it's not very uh, mathematics. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I nailed again the bottom in VIX, uh, and it happened uh, the same way uh, the past two times. So um, yeah, it's, I guess this is what will happen. Then I will uh, check what you are saying about correlation, uh, what uh, maybe Vi is saying uh, regarding uh, if he's pressing shorts, etc. But uh, yeah, or maybe I just want to be it to be perfect. I mean, shorting now, considering where we are going uh, in the next leg in uh, the bear market, uh, I mean, it would not be a problem, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And I, I like what you said about. Um, I mean, it makes a lot of sense that you know VIX could look go lower, and you're just looking at kind of how how it worked right after the BMR at the beginning of April. Like S and P drew down the entire time when VIX was going down and retesting that same kind of concept. And then when VIX went is after you got like a, a few days of sideways action on S&P, which could be very well what happens right now, just sideways action on S&P before then you get the big drawdown again. So, um, yeah, I, yeah, like with that perspective, then you have a couple options. Like if S&P isn't going to go any further and you're just short equities and not really playing the vol side via, option, via options, then, um, yeah, you can just stay short stocks right now and just, you know, wait unless you see something that confirms a squeeze higher um i just i, I like if we see 4200 on s p like we're gonna see 43 and if we see 43 like we're gonna make a new high like i i, I don't think if the, like if the if we don't at least go sideways or then break down even with whatever vix does um like I think the BMR isn't over at that point because if we get back to 4,300, you're going to get more call buying above again. And we have a lot of time this time before the next OPEX and limited catalyst too between then because that will probably come after Jackson Hole. So I think like if this isn't – if the top is not in, we're probably not going to top out again until 4,400. And so like that would be clear then if, if we are going to squeeze, we go above 415 here. And that comes down with VIX. But I, yeah, I think a better scenario 
which is totally possible, is VIX goes down to 21, but shorts keep working between now and then. If you're patient and you're not getting chopped up on a day like today, like today, you know, I wasn't really covering. I was just pressing a little more when we went up to like 40, when we went to SPY 415. So you could take the t- same concept and not expect maybe a huge drawdown until until you what plays out like what you, like what you said, Raph, with we go retest 21. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would agree. Uh, uh, sideways is the most plausible scenario, uh, considering again what happened before. I mean, we could get a retest of uh, yeah, something like near 4200. Uh, I don't know if uh, yeah if we go above uh, 4300, then we have to make new high. Uh, but yeah, uh, sideways would be the most plausible uh, scenario. But definitely the the VIX base is uh, is done. I mean, it uh, the same way it did at the end of December, the same way it did at the, the end of uh, March, it's done. The VIX base uh, for the next uh, spike in uh, in VIX uh, is already over. So does it mean uh, we can go higher in equities? Does it mean we uh, we go lower? Does it mean it goes sideways until we get the, the VIX move? This, I don't know. I just know the VIX uh, has already bottomed for the next uh, crash, for the yeah. next part of the movie. Yeah, I like it. It'll, it'll be really, yeah, it's just going to be really interesting to see what equities do. Like, but, like, I think you either get the VIX down, like you said, and equities go sideways or maybe slightly down. But then if we go above 4,200, I mean, the bottom collars are going to come out in even more force than what we just saw. I mean, the squeeze is going to be really big. Like, I will, I will get the heck out of the way. If we do get above 4,200, I'll tell you that. So um, at least based on the structure I see right now and then and then the catalysts that are lining up. So, uh, yeah, I'd be very careful up there, even shorting 4,300. But I guess we'll see. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah, usually I make make fun of people who are, who are doing technical analysis on VIX. But this time I'll, I'll skip whatever works. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, I remembered that I, I wanted to mention uh, one last thing uh, that I don't know if you noticed uh, for those pe- people who are using MFR that for the last couple of days, even uh, more than a couple of days, uh, indices. So, for example, S and P 500, which is bullish trend, had. Uh, not a lot of downside and uh, quite a lot of upside. And VIX uh, had uh, uh, not a lot of, uh, uh, so basically uh, vice versa. So not a lot of uh, for upside, but a lot of downside. I'm talking about upside downside ratio. So uh, that was uh, another interesting thing that basically stopped me from uh, shorting the markets because I don't know, I, I mentioned that in my videos, I believe, but from the range perspective, the most important things after trend and Hearst uh, uh, is the upside-downside ra- ratio. So usually I look not ne- necessarily into the exact values where the low is, where the top is, and so on, but upside-downside. And basically when I saw that uh, volatility, which is bearish, uh, basically has not a lot of upside uh, and uh, indices that are bullish have not a lot of downside. That was also one reason uh, why basically I was not willing to press the button. So yeah, also maybe it helps for for some of you. Yeah, but this, this setup is usually uh, interesting and not the best setup for those who want to short the market aggressively, basically. Hey, if I I got a question about Hearst. Like with them just so high right now, you know, you got 0.8s, 0.7s. I mean, the way that we discussed how that works is just the idea that you know, if a stock is is down today and it's got a 0.8 Hearst, it's got an 8 percent chance of being down tomorrow. And so, you know, how do you think about that then with us a- approaching like some potential chop? I mean, you know, wh- when would you start chasing something higher, chasing something lower that has a strong Hearst like that, expecting it to trend, like? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, uh, it 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 makes an absolute sense. So, uh, regarding the Hearst, one other thing uh, I look is, of course, the direction compared to yesterday. So, uh, <coughs> so, so sorry. Uh, so basically, if Hearst are Hearst are still strengthening or, or no? So because. Uh, of course, at those levels, Hurst uh, are close to peaking because, I mean, 
Hurston Spy can go to one because I mean, if it, if it would go to one, it would mean that basically for the last three months, it, every day it went to the same direction, which all we all know that it's not possible. So, so of course, high hers uh, uh, can be a reversal signal, but the first exponent, that reversal signal is in first, not necessarily. Uh, in price, so regarding uh, chasing, no, I would never chase anything high or low based on uh, Hearst alone. Uh, but uh, uh, like I said, it gives me more convi conviction to write the moves when I have all, all other uh, signals right. That's why uh, it's important, because all other signals for me says the what uh, I want to do. So if I want to buy something, if I want to sell something or close some positions or whatever, and the first exponent tells me basically uh, how, when I want to open a position, how to trade it. So if I want it, so if you, I want to ride that and so on. So, but no, uh, I, I would not chase that based on high Hurst alone. So, so uh, because usually, uh, and how I define chop uh, in this market, uh, basically I, d I define uh, chop when uh, correlations uh, doesn't uh, support the momentum and the hearse. So uh, then I don't look uh, for, for the chop definition. I don't look into a trend. I don't look into the range uh, for the chop definition. Basically, I look into the correlations, uh, momentum and hearse. And if they, if all three of those are uh, supporting uh, each other basically and if not for me it's a chop and uh, of course uh, the lower the hearst the stronger the chop so uh, yeah the high hearst uh, now the, the chop is not very uh, strong chop but i but because of uh, mixed signals in, in correlations and momentums uh, i still expect that we can get some uh, uh, crazy days where basically one day it it goes up, another day it goes down, or or it just moves sideways and so on. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, yeah sure. I mean, I guess, I guess like um, let's like get into a specific example, like XLU right now. So this is yeah. something that I was I was really interested in actually shorting this time around, just looking at how it's behaved coming off of the um the prior tops. So I mean, this was actually an example you put in one of your Hearst videos, just like. Look at the chart of XLU. That's something that has a high Hearst, basically. And it does. It's got the yes. highest Hearst of the, of the ETS sectors. And so, like, I was kind of sizing into XLU when we were getting into the point where I thought we would reserve, reverse up towards 4,300 and then want to ride that lower um, on red days because of it having a high Hearst. And the fact that it's, you know, down on a day with a 0.8 Hearst you know, has me ride it lower. Is that, is that a good perspective to have and trade something like that? Oh, yeah, now I understand. Uh, sorry, regarding what you meant uh, with chasing. Uh, yeah, it's a very good example. And uh, uh, yeah, that's a, that's exactly how I think. Yeah, so if you have a position and it's going in your uh, direction and uh, he first supports that, so keeping it to, for, for it to go lower is uh, yeah exactly what I do. Awesome. Yeah. Cause you know, I was just, cause one, one thing I really did up the top is, you know, I looked at the combination of two things like the long-term say this long-term ranges MFR. And then I used the Hearst exponents in MFR. So like XOU perfect example there was totally skewed between the near term and long-term ranges. And then it had a super high Hearst. And so what I'd expect then is that once it turned, which it has now at this point, it would continue trending lower. And so like, what's really interesting now it turned it trended lower for three days kept a strong Hearst, and then now we've had a green day. And so since we had a green day today, um, you know, the odds are that it's green tomorrow or it reverses again and trends lower kind of from there. So I guess you have to – so like, for example, like XLU specifically right now, because it has a high Hearst, we were green today, so actually I expect it to potentially be green tomorrow. Looking specifically at that 415 level, if we get above and we're going to squeeze – the things with the high hearse are the things that are going to squeeze even harder, and that'll trend all the way to what I would think at that point, like 4,400. And so, like XLU, I would absolutely dump that if there's going to be an equity squeeze from here because it has the high hearse. And then, actually, things you would want to be short at that point are things with low hearse, low hearse that actually could either chop down or sideways with a broad equity squeeze. So um, that's just just something to think about. Yeah, absolutely correct. Great comments. 
So, funny enough, we don't have uh, questions. I don't know, Rafael, are we making bets today? Is the top in? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, we can we can do this. But I guess everybody will say yes. <laughs> I don't know, man. Uh, uh, yeah, something more complicated. Uh, something like contra contra to what everybody feels. Yeah, let's do something else. Yeah. Uh, uh, oil, maybe. Something about oil. Uh, okay, uh, what yeah. uh, what contra are we talking? USO or futures or what? Uh, US oil, just uh, US... Crude, crude oil price. Uh... USO, okay. No, no, the WTI uh, crude oil price. I okay. So let's say, let's see. Um, yeah, we're gonna see. Uh, will it be above uh, one ten uh, before? Uh, yeah, two weeks, maybe a little. Uh, one ten, maybe. Yeah. You're crazy. Are you crazy? <laughs> yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually uh, seeing some very interesting stuff right now, and uh, I'm thinking, uh, yeah, you want to take the bet? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm also seeing some interesting uh, signals in oil, and also to the same direction as you. Yeah, but I will say no because uh, I think that uh, one ten in two weeks uh, less likely. Yeah, but I don't know. Uh, I think oil will be higher than today, but uh, not uh, one ten. That's okay. my bet. Let, let's say one hundred. One hundred. It's okay. easier. Oh, okay. Uh, so ab okay. above one hundred, not close, but at least touch above. 100, yes or no? Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Okay. I, think yeah, it could I, hit one, I think it could hit 100 in, in one day. Yes, <laughs> it can. <laughs> okay, so maybe it was, okay, it's 110, let's say 110, this way it's easier. Okay. So you say no, right? No, no. Okay, Matt? Matt says yes. Okay, Brian? You know, because if it hits 110, that's going to be just so bloody bearish. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, man. Like oil, oil is freaking me out right now. I don't know what it's going to do. Like I, I'm not short in energy stocks. I'm not long energy stocks. I, I mean, like if you look at your trend drop, like on the on the daily, um, the daily trade. Yes. I mean, it's been like bouncing right off of it, and it's, and it's held so far. Yeah, I saw it. It's crazy. But, um, you know, yeah. If it if it goes up there, it it's gonna rip. And one thing that's interesting, like if oil rips, and then you might get broad commodities with it. Um, I think bonds might get whacked, and like that could be a scenario where actually the ten year yield goes back to a cycle high if we do get this oil at one ten. So um, that's something to watch for sure. Yeah, I agree with Brian. Basically, that's exactly what I think. If that happens, it will be whoa. <laughs> Okay, so I say uh, yes, of course, and uh, we're gonna see. It's crazy bet, but uh, yeah, why not? I mean, sure. Okay, that's it. Uh, okay, so I think that we're, we're done for today. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining. Um, thanks Brian, Raphael, Matt, and uh, hopefully see you all in uh, two weeks and manage your risk. Bye. See ya, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye.